Tonight's guest is Dr. Anthony Muhammad. Anthony is one of the most influential educators of our time. And I have said this and I believe it to my core. He is an author, a speaker, a presenter, and he has influenced our world of education for going on 30 years now. He is the author of his seminal book, Transforming School Culture, which I took everywhere as a school leader. And it really was a, a book that really helped us examine our attitudes, our beliefs, our assumptions that sometimes held us back as a school community. He is also the author of Time for Change with my good friend, Dr. Luis Cruz, Revisiting Professional Learning Communities at Work, uh, Beyond Conversations About Race, as well as I think his most courageous book, Overcoming the Achievement Gap Trap, as well as a number of other books. We're gonna dig into those books, uh, Anthony's work, his journey, and what's he up to today? It really is a thrill and an honor to have Anthony on tonight. I am so excited to have you all learn a little bit more about what he's been up to lately and all the things that he's doing to make our world a better place. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Anthony Muhammad to a conversation with Brian. Anthony, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for the invitation. And it's an honor to, uh, you know, not only do I respect you as a, an educator, but you're also, I consider you a good friend. So even if we weren't, uh, you know, uh, fellow educators, I'd have done it just because you asked me to do it because we're just good friends. Well, I do appreciate that, Anthony. And I would be remiss if I didn't share that, you know, that in the uh, intro, I didn't share that you were recognized by Global Gurus as one of the 30 most influential educators and thought leaders in the world. Um, and this is going on three years. This year, you've moved up and you're like number six now. And that's just amazing. And I, I look yeah. at people, Anthony, Eric Jensen, Diane Ravitch, um, who was a policy person with, you know, the Bush administration, and she actually flipped in terms of, you know, her uh, stance on, you know, testing and No Child Left Behind, uh, Principal Kefele, Tom Herrick, John Hattie, you know, Salam Khan of Khan Academy, jo uh, Joseph Renzulli, Anthony, T Tina Bugren, Carol Ann Tomlinson, and the list goes on and on. And I say that because I'm fans of all those people and I've read them deeply, but I don't think there's anybody who has influenced me on that list more than you have in terms of the way I go about my business um, in, uh, as an educator and when I was a principal because of the, the work you did around culture. And so I think that's how highly I think of you. But that's even that's even uh, more flattering than being called a global guru. So that that uh, I can add that feather in my cap. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And you you've know, been quite an influence on me, especially my thinking around uh, gifted education and the stance you took as a principal and the issues of equity and access. So you've been quite a, a powerful influence on me as well. Thanks, Anthony. You know, at the beginning of each one of my shows, I asked my guests to talk about their personal journey and their professional story and how they got to where they are today as educators and <laughs> And, and really what drives them and continues to drive them because you know you've worked a lot you travel a lot and you don't have to do this right mm -hmm. you could just settle in retire and just you know live a good life and not, not that you're not living a good life now because I think it's a meaningful life but you know talk a little bit about your personal story your professional journey and how you got to be where you are today well um I grew up in Flint Michigan and um that's essential to how I shape my my approach to education and my choice to be an educator. Um, growing up in Flint in the 70s and early 80s, Flint was a poster child for industrial prosperity. And the, the kind of the ideology of the school system was that it was a place to hang out until you either dropped out and worked in the factory right. or you graduated and worked in the factory. So the whole idea of investing in the development of the human being it's kind of foreign. It was school was you're kind of like a hostage. Right. And you can get released early or you can wait till your 12th grade. But I didn't know anybody that really liked school. My mother made me tolerate it and she made me um, 
achieve by their standards. So my mother was a teacher. Yeah. But I can't say I learned a whole lot as a student. I, 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 as Matthew Haberman called it, I played the game of schoolsmanship. Yeah. I turned in all my homework. I studied enough for the test to get decent grades. And I graduated with a decent GPA. I was in my top 10, my graduating class. And I got an athletic scholarship uh, to run track at Michigan State. <clears throat> and that's really, that was my biggest motivation for achieving was I wanted to play college athletics. Sure. And as I went off to Michigan State, I started hearing about some of my best buddies who were starting to get into trouble because of deindustrialization. So the factory started closing and then the drugs moved in. This right. is kind of, this is pre-crack, but drugs were still pretty prevalent. Crack just took it over the top. Yeah. Um, and I lost a couple of good friends. Uh, one got incarcerated. So I started to think as I was in college, like what I want to do with my life. Cause I started as an accounting major, go figure. Really? Yeah. And it was boring. Then I got into uh, pre-law. And I did a, a, a legal internship for credit over the summer. And it was watching paint dry would have been an improvement. <laughs> and then I was hearing all these things about my friends <clears throat> and how I had kind of escaped it because I had an educational pathway. And I said, I know what I want to do. I want to be a teacher. And I wanted to work in the schools that were the most challenging because I knew my friends weren't thugs. Right. I knew they were intelligent. I knew that they had dreams and aspirations and our school system didn't do a whole lot, whole lot to support that and can't put it all in them because community didn't do a whole lot to support it. Right. So I thought the best way I could make a difference was to be a teacher. I started off as a middle school teacher, then became a middle school assistant principal, then a middle school principal. Uh, I spent a tenure as a high school principal. That's kind of overblown because I had to do double duty between the middle and the high school because they had lost a principal. Okay. So that's a nice resume, but I'm, I'm really a middle school guy because I thought adolescence was the best place to catch kids. And then the consulting thing became an extension of that uh, experience that now I could have more influence. So my hometown of Flint, Michigan and cities like it and seeing people that I knew had value and were important uh, being overlooked and discarded uh, was my motivation for really uh, making education my my vocation, so to say? Did you ever think about? Uh, I you know listened to you on a number of podcasts, and I know I know the answer to this, but I like my audience to hear it. Did you ever um, you know think about staying in the classroom um, when you first started, or did you think about uh, administration right off the bat? Like I'm going to be a teacher for a certain, so many years, and then I'm going to become an administrator, or was it just it just evolved? It evolved. Uh, I just wanted to be a teacher because uh, I wanted to be as close to the kids as possible. Mm -hmm. And when I got certified um, in 1990 as a um, middle school teacher, I was one of five African-American males under 25 in Michigan with a teaching certification. That's just my. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, under 25, I was one yeah. of five. Wow. And I was a commodity. So they kept pulling me to administration, but I didn't want to go because I didn't, there weren't very many leadership blueprints sure. uh, that I had witnessed or any leaders that I really admired uh, in our district. Uh, first year I was principal, our principal was taken away six months into my first year over a scandal. Wow. And honestly, I forgot who the principal, I would forget who the principal was yeah. uh, from time to time because it was such a revolving door. And I didn't send kids to the office. So that wasn't, <clears throat> As long as my check showed up on time and my classroom keys worked, right. that's really all I needed. Um, so right around year four, they started asking me about administration. And I pushed back and I pushed back and they kept asking and then um, started having more and more children. Then that teacher check just didn't seem to <laughs> yeah. go. So the, the, their persistence and then my financial need Right. I was, I, I was, they dragged me into administration, but I was glad they did because yeah. now I got a chance to think about systemic impact right. as opposed to just classroom impact. When you were an administrator, did you, um, 
and this is just a question that that I always got because I I always felt like I was a bit on a, a bit on an island um, because I kind of always felt like this the system wasn't working for all kids and and although we had good decent people hardworking people in the system I always felt like um, they they would not buck the system and I, and, I, and I said I I could not allow for some of the things that were happening to happen in our school. So I just said, we were just gonna be an island. And so when you were as, as a principal, did you ever feel like you were on an island because of the Absolutely. thing? Absolutely, Alcatraz. Like yeah. I wanted to be as far away from the district as possible. Yeah. And and shelter um, my school from it. Almost almost put a fortress around it. Yeah. Um, because I knew a lot of decisions were being made for that, that, because they were expedient. Right. They were politically uh, correct. It wasn't necessarily what was best for kids. Then you add the added factor of really, really militant unions. Um, and a lot of my superintendents spent time just fighting the union. Right. Uh, who really, and, and unfortunately, acted in many cases to stifle innovation. Yeah. Any disagreement or grievance a teacher had, they would use the treasury that have been given to other members to really protect some of the most um, poor performing and, and, and selfish people in their system. So I just try to create really, really good relationships with my teachers yeah. <clears throat> so I could build relationships to get things done. But I knew, I, I learned early that if I kept going to district office for permission, yeah, yeah, it was always, I'd rather just do it and then ask for forgiveness later. I remember you were talking in one of your speeches, and you, you said something about how you gave all of your um, students an opportunity to have algebra. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was like revolutionary. Like, like mm -hmm. people are like, why are you doing that? This kid's not ready. But you're like, that's the gatekeeper, right? And so mm -hmm. what were you thinking? Were you just saying, I'm just going to do this, and we're going to figure out how to make sure that we scaffold and support students to be successful? And your kids were successful. Well, in our mission statement, it said something about students learning to their highest potential. You yeah. know, that language is mixed in. Mm -hmm. Well, I yeah. asked them, what is that? Yeah. And in our school, middle school, it was algebra. And also, the companion was, there's a science gatekeeper. We offer, off, also offered earth science in yeah. eighth grade. Yeah. So the deal was, these are two high school courses. Yeah. If kids completed one or both, they get one or two high school credits, depending on how they 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 completed them. Sure. So um, we only had about seven percent of our kids on that track. So with my leadership team, call them a guiding coalition, mm -hmm. we started scaling it up. Yeah. And building interventions and supports. So if we wanted to go from seven percent to fifteen percent. Let's look at the kids who are close. Sure. Let's go from fifteen percent to forty. Right. And forty to seventy-five, and it worked out. But that time, that flywheel effect had happened mm -hmm. that uh, uh, Collins yeah. talks about, so yeah. it was kicking. So the, yeah. first, it's kind of, it's a grind. But then once that flywheel effect kicks in, my staff got excited for it. But what happened, I think you might have heard from one of my keynotes, is that then that put a shock in the system. Because our high school wasn't prepared yeah. for 300 plus kids who are ready for a schedule in ninth grade that included biology and geometry. Right. and I had to almost pull the, the leverage of my parents to apply political pressure, sure. put the district in such a precarious position because what happened was our students' preparation, there, there were two policies that clashed. The policy in the district promised that if you completed that, you would get the two credits and you would get biology and geometry. Right. Well, the high school schedule had to be completed in February. Mm. And how can you predict how many kids are going to right. pass if a quarter of your kids won't even complete eighth grade until June? Exactly. So it was an anticipation of a bell curve. Right. It'll be a small percentage of kids. Well, the district is over a barrel. They made that policy. Now you got to deliver. Yeah. Yeah. The union's upset because you told teachers you're going to place them in February. But now they have to be moved because you don't have enough certified teachers. In geometry and biology, so some had to be pushed down to middle school. Some of their earth science teachers and uh, uh, geom and uh, algebra teachers, and people had to be moved to the high school with the geometry certification. They had to hire a few people. 
that's a good problem to have. I was gonna say your success forced the the system to change. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when we um we met in 2005, that's when I started with Rick DeFore, our, our connection. Um, I he asked me to join and become an associate. And I think you started before then. Yeah, it was 2003. Yeah, about a couple of years yeah. before then. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about um your relationship with Rick and and how he kind of not gave you an ultimatum, but actually kind of said, this is, this is, you know, what you need to do uh, in order, because you kind of challenged him on this PLC thing, mm -hmm. but then you, you, he kind of put it back in your, your lap. So can you talk a little bit well, about yeah. that and then just kind of talk about your journey as you, you and Mike now, I mean, once, you know, since Rick has passed um, and Bob Aker has taken, you know, a little bit of a, you know, back seat because um, he's, he's really, you know, pretty much retired, but you and Mike Mattis are now the face of the PLC at work movement. And so can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's a, a great start for the rest of our conversation in, in your books. Because yeah. I didn't, I didn't really know what uh, a consultant was. I didn't know what that was. I went to a conference, uh, Lincolnshire, mm -hmm. uh, PLC, uh, Adelaide Stevenson High School. Right. There were late Dr. Rick DeFore had just retired as superintendent. It was the second year of the PLC Institutes. And it wasn't, it was kind of sparsely attended. Right. And I was so enamored with what I heard. But most of the, it was Rick, Rebecca had just joined the team. It was her first year. And Dr. Bob, Dr. Right. Bob Aker. And most of the breakout percenters were staff at Stevenson High School, which, if you don't know, is not the most um, ethnically diverse place. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, all the faculty was white. Right. I was enamored and I went and I, I told Rick how enamored I was, but I said I was a little bit disturbed about there was no minority representation. Right. And he said, well, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> I, I was trying to run a guilt trip on him and he he, he did the Jedi mind trick <laughs> and flipped it back on me. I said, well, yeah. OK. And he agreed to work with me. Rick when always, he said, wait, hold on a second. When he said that, did you did you automatically garner some respect? From him, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, Where, I was just gonna say that Rick respected people who weren't yes people, yeah, who were deep thinkers who pushed the envelope, uh, who would challenge him, and we had some um, challenging conversations where he pushed my thinking. I mean, I mean, anybody that knows Rick knows he pushed your thinking, sure. and if you're reading my work, you know I'm deeply influenced by him, yeah. But he respected people who challenged him too, yeah. Because he liked a good intellectual challenge. I was talking to Dr. Uh, Eric Twardell, who's the current superintendent of Adelaide Stevenson, and I talked about a conversation that Dr. DeFore and I had probably about three years before he passed. The concept, kind of the Howard Gardner school of and Roland Barth, that mm -hmm. you can't change people's thinking or their beliefs, but you have to make them engage in different ways of practice. Right. And if you do that, then that changes their mind. And I told Rick, I thought that was a pretty simplistic, naive approach. An example I gave is that, you know, people are really excited in January after making New Year's resolutions right. about getting in shape. So they go and they buy all the equipment, they sign up, and many make great progress. They see the result, but then they, half of them will backslide by April or May, even though they've seen better results, because there was something deeper psychologically that hadn't been addressed. If you hadn't gotten to the root of why a person right. became, uh, uh, lost their fitness, yeah. or weren't physically what they should have been, if those issues aren't addressed, even with better results, you can backslide. Yeah. And I had a chance to say, I thought that that, that philosophy, and how, you know, who, could, how, who could just totally criticize Howard Gardner, he's a genius, but I thought that approach didn't address issues like racism yeah. and class bias yeah. and deep-rooted uh, uh, bigotry and bias, whether it's sexism or racism. So yeah. Rick always respected people who weren't yes people, yeah. who were challenging. And I think that's why he um, pegged me to be a part of the team to advance the work when he left, because he knew that if I was willing to challenge him, I would be an intellectual force to be reckoned with to advance the work. I think when you, when you think about it, Anthony, I think we all at some point, if you know, we can't know everything, right? 
Mm-hmm. And we also, and I think Rick probably realized he had a blind spot mm-hmm. and he couldn't, he couldn't, if you have a blind spot and, no, and nobody tells you about it, it's still mm-hmm. a blind spot. You still can't yeah. see it. Yeah. You felt, you filled that blind spot, mm-hmm. you know? And so I think that's, that was probably something that he was like, gosh, I, I need, I need Anthony because I, I don't know what, I only know what I know. Yeah. And, I don't know and, what I know. and he was open to alternative perspectives. Yeah. If you brought evidence. Yep. And you and, and you could challenge his thinking in a way that was objective and was evidence based. He wasn't a big fan of emotional reactions yeah. or just being indifferent. And I still believe that Gardner's philosophy has a lot of merit. Yeah. You can't really deeply change until you engage in the process and you get some results. You have to actually do it yeah. to see the result. But if you don't also have to simultaneously address the triggers that that put you in a position to begin with. And I was able to convince Rick that both were valid, that there was another side of it. And he respected that. Do you think the evidence mm-hmm. of, um, you know, when they started the PLC at work model or movement, and they started to show evidence of improvement in some schools, but I have to be honest, there were a lot of schools that would say they're PLC and then they would they would backslide or they would just totally abandon it. And I mm-hmm. think that cultural piece that you lend and the things that, and, and, and your voice and your expertise that you lent to it, I think it truly has shored up this model because I have, you know, you know, Rick came into our school, Rick and Becky came into our school district, which is a, a district of like 100, 180 schools at the time. And they, they were there for a couple of years, just, you know, training staff and, and making sure that, they were, you know, truly on the same page. But I have to be honest, 90% of the schools kind of just lost it. And after, you know, a couple of years, because they couldn't keep the momentum going and they couldn't, it was kind of like, you know, Jim, Jim Collins says, you know, that level four leader, mm-hmm. level four leader was like that the person was a yep, rah, rah person. When that person left, it just, mm-hmm tanked and so cops had that level five yeah yeah to take, exactly. yeah, to, yeah and um that was the challenge rick put on my shoulders yeah is to push people beyond the the plc light yeah and it really boils down to and this is something i think that every leader um in american schools because a lot of these issues i'm addressing a lot of them are uniquely american i've had the pleasure to speak all over all over the world and there's some things that are that are common across the world Right. But the test score driven comparison, ranking, sorting and selecting, it hurts schools at both sides on both sides of that, that, yeah. that continuum. Um, and it really change comes down to dissatisfaction. Uh, is change is always inconvenient. Yeah. And is the inconvenience worth the potential benefit? So if I'm a school in Virginia and by all means, I'm satisfied then why would I change? Right. I could get a little better, but is the inconvenience of the of the the investment I make worth it? Right. Do enough of our kids do well enough that working as a team and giving up autonomy, sharing my curriculum, engaging more frequently and assessing together, being vulnerable to have my results analyzed, to participate in a multi-tiered system of support. Right. When I weigh that against my current situation, the reason 90% will backslide is that this is just not worth it. Or the opposite side is we feel so hopeless because of our test scores, because of the labels we've received. Right. And we just don't have the efficacy or the optimism to believe that we can do any better because these kids are hopeless. We had years and years of bad evidence and it sounds good, but to maintain the stamina, to stay engaged in it long enough takes hope and hopefulness. Right. So either it's hubris or it's learned helplessness. And that's why so many schools get stuck there. I think Rick understood that my insight on that topic would help advance so that more schools could really do PLC right instead of PLC like. Yeah. And that's been kind of my mission the last two or three years. In your... um. In your book, Transform, Transforming School Culture, and now with Luis um, and Time for Change, 
you you really give tools and those are the tools that I use when I when I do anything this is not just beyond you know just school but when I almost do anything I use these these skills to you know help us move forward in anything that I do can you talk a little bit about the 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 skills that um you talk about transformational leaders need if they're going to really move their school forward and keep the momentum going. I mean, you talked about, you know, wh why people, you know, see it as PLC light. Um, a lot of people just say, I don't know how to do this. And they don't have the proper time and support training to sure. do this. So can you talk a little bit about those tools? Sure, sure. Um, the evidence is pretty clear. I think the Wallace Foundation, uh, their leadership study uh, kind of laid the, the, the groundwork that systemic change is almost impossible without effective leadership. Yeah. You're not gonna get you're not gonna get systemic transformation or even school transformation without good leadership. What you'll get at best are pockets of innovation, yeah. pockets of and you'll get those outliers. Right. That great third grade team who just does it because it's the right thing. But you you won't get systemic excellence. So leadership is really essential. So I couldn't find a school in studying schools all over the world that had healthy cultures that did not have effective leaders. Right. So we really wanted to study, okay, what was it about those leaders' behaviors that made the culture healthy? A developing culture is one part of a leader's responsibility to others. You have to manage, you have to be fiscally responsible, but transformation and culture is a big part of what a leader does. So I'm not saying these are the only skills. Right. If you want to create a healthy culture, we found that there were four skills that leaders possessed. They really built and, and, and quickened the cooperation in people who want to change and, and deal with the inconvenience and disruptive nature of change. And the first one was uh, effective communication. Right. Communication, Dr. Cruz and I call a meeting of the minds. I can have the greatest vision in the world. Here's what I'm going to take my school. But if I don't have a, an effective way to share the logic of that vision with those that I lead, then they have to guess. It becomes ambiguous. Right. Then I can get frustrated because you're not moving at the pace I expect, Brian, but I never really let you in on why working on a team is so important. What's the sense of urgency? Why is what we're doing not working? Why is working as a team better than working as an individual? What evidence do we have that if we worked as a team, we could improve? I might even think we I might not even think we need to improve. You have to communicate that to me. And how is what you're suggesting the best pathway forward? So we found that when a leader does that, those who are really intellectual, you get a meeting of the mind. Oh, we're not, we're gonna get rid of um uh, snap suspensions because the kids are suspended, come back. And they, they're worse off. Here's the data. Right. Here's a better way. So it's not that a person had, had, was, had malice. They just didn't know what to do. Sure. And they understand why your vision makes sense. That, that, that light bulb goes on. You know, when, when we talk about the, the, the PLC at work process, and I remember Rick always saying, you start that you know, process by learning together. Learn together. And so, you know, or, you know building collective, engaging in collective inquiry. But you know, when what happens when a a leader feels like they don't know as much as their staff? They come into a new school and they don't know too much as, their, as much as their staff. Is that the time where we say sit down and learn together and be like you said, be vulnerable? Is that mm -hmm. is that a time to do that? I would say so, but it, that, that leader needs to really um, study. Yeah, I'd ask the district why would you hire a leader who is uh, professionally insecure? And and it is less know, capacity. You know, you know that happens though, right? I, but I would ask the district, why would they do that? Yeah. But if they did, if, if you find yourself in that position, that's just being self-aware that I need to really, if my staff is really sharp, yeah, and they have insight that I don't, it's hard to submit to somebody who you look at as an intellectual inferior. Yeah. So yeah. you're gonna have to step your game up. So that'd be my recommendation. What if, and, and again, it's it. What if somebody had to follow Anthony Muhammad at a school? They don't know much as much as you do, and so that's what I'm saying. They they would have to submit a little bit. Well, it's they don't great. really need to, um, but they need to be able to articulate whoever's hiring them. And I would recommend that the 
teachers be a part of that uh, interviewing process to look for qualities that that person has that were similar or yeah. add something to where they're going. Again, I said, it's hard to submit to someone you see as an intellectual inferior. Yeah. And when, you, when you're insecure, learn more. The second characteristic is the ability to build trust. So you might move, Brian, I see all the books behind you because you're intellectual. Others will follow because there's a meeting of the heart. Yeah. You've built trust and you've created um, um, an emotionally secure environment. Some people resist change because perhaps there was a tyrant before you. Right. Maybe they were mistreated. Maybe they were misused. So you can communicate all the logic you want to somebody that's emotionally wounded. And that's not the language that they're speaking. Yeah. They want to know that you're safe to follow. Right. The third is capacity building. That people tend not to engage in practices that they don't feel secure in their ability to execute. And that could include resources, training, time, coaching. As I get more secure, that's one of the reasons, Brian, I never really got into video games. I didn't want to get my butt kicked for a month by my kids <laughs> yeah. to get better at it. Yeah. It was my insecurity and my skill. Right. You know, I didn't know how to work. There's too many buttons on the joysticks. I just didn't play. Yeah. But if somebody would have coached me and built my skill set, I probably would have had more confidence. Play. So if a leader is a great communicator, knows how to build relationships and heal wounds, often wounds you didn't create, yeah. wounds that you inherited, you're clear in your resource allocation and support of people who need some development in the things you're asking them to do. What we found is most people will submit. Those are logical needs, rational needs. But there's a fourth group that that's not their issue. It's just that you can't make it. Right. It's an ego trip. It's a power struggle. I get it. I trust you. I know how to do it. I'm just making a, an autonomous choice that you can't make me. And this is when the leader has to go to their most primal tool in the toolbox, which is authority. Yeah. You get it. You know how. You know how to do it. At this point, I'm showing courage on behalf of the decisions and the investments we've made as a staff. And you don't have the right to disregard everything that we've decided and become an outlier because you want to be insufferable. I'm going to use my authority to make you learn by doing. And if you successful, maybe it'll change your mind, maybe it won't. But at this point, I'm not trying to change your, I'm not trying to impact you intellectually or emotionally capacity. I'm influence you, influencing you with authority. And so most will come with support. The rest will come with authority. And, and that's the last two of them. Yeah. And, and in, in my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you don't want to start with that tool. No, it's, support comes before yeah. accountability. Accountability is unethical. Yeah. If I haven't met those needs that I met earlier, then I'm weaponizing authority to, to, to substitute for my poor communication yeah. or my lack of emotional intelligence. Or other essential skills. Yeah. It's the last, last tool in the toolbox. And from my experience, if you start there, then you're just going to get compliance. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. You might not even get that right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's just from a ratio perspective, there's so many people who have legitimate needs. And if you demonize everyone, you don't even have a critical mass yet, to even leverage peer pressure. Yeah. Yeah. So you you know, might not even, you might not even get compliance. In your, in your work, um, you have a group now, Transforming School Culture, um, and you have some associates. Mm -hmm. T talk to me a little bit about um, how that came about and, and, and what the work of your associates is now. Is it just primarily to um, promote your work around school culture and time for change? And, and how do you make sure that they're all on the same page speaking Anthony Muhammad's language? Yeah, great question. Well, Solution Tree is kind of built kind of a machine that way. And the PLC movement was kind of the blueprint. Um, they are a publishing company, so um, they support authors. Yeah. And anybody that is a speaker comes from the work of an author. Yeah. So Rick DeFore and Bob Aker 
and then later joined by Becky DeFore, published some early PLC work, and they were the ambassadors. But as you know, if you know, if the demand is greater than the supply, then you have to increase the supply. Yeah. And that's where associates come in. When an author's work becomes so popular that that author cannot service customers alone. Yeah. So they deputize what are called associates who are deputized to go out and work on behalf of that author's work. And over the years, that part of that company has grown significantly. So I have a little over 20 associates now, and we plan trainings once or twice a year. It's ironic you asked that question. I was just in Bloomington, Indiana last Friday and Saturday doing training for new associates. Okay. So I take them through a crash course, almost like a graduate course, right. on all the essential tenets of my work. And then they get some, some coaching on presentation style and PowerPoints and relationships with um, uh, hosts. Uh, host districts, and then they get the right, and it, it, as the work comes up, sure. they get they get an audition. It's an opportunity. I got my opportunity um, in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. My Virginia, first one, really, yeah. <laughs> Spotsylvania County. It was in a middle school uh, 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 library. Wow! And I said, "This is my shot. Yeah. I need to do so well that they said we like this guy." So then when somebody else calls and Rick, Becky, or Bob aren't ready, aren't available, then I can do that. And it just kind of snowballed. And we also get exposure. We have a Transforming School Culture Conference coming up in Plano, Texas in October. So we'll feature some of my associates there. So people come to ticketed uh, conferences, get exposure, and yep. they say, hey, you know, I really like you, Tune Day Reeves. I really like Carlos Johnson. Right. I really like Alex McNeese. Can you come to my school? And they start building their brand. Yeah. And it just starts growing. So it starts with an author and that author's work becomes more popular than their ability to service clientele that others are deputized. But they're really careful and methodical about making sure that those who represent that work uh, have a knowledge level and also presentation skills. Yeah. I know we all know, Brian, some people who are really smart who can't hold an audience yeah. for 30 minutes. Right. So then what they know doesn't become transferable because they need a skill in their presentation ability. So we work on both. Yeah. Let's, let's transition because we don't have much time left. And I do appreciate you coming on, Anthony, but I did want to get to the, the book that, and, and you probably laughed at me about in 2015 when I was doing my walking stints, I used to walk all over the place and I was on Facebook and I would be writing like a review of each chapter of your book. And on Facebook, I was writing like four pages right. of each chapter. And then you're probably like, he's a nut. Well, um, thorough, it's almost as thorough as the book. I was like, <laughs> just rewritten the book. But, you know, when I started to read Overcoming the Achievement Gap, you know, Liberating Mindsets to Affect Change, and I looked at your, your insights um, on the complex issues of race and the achievement gap and equity and poverty, um, and you, you, you know, provided this great historical context to why we were at the point we were in 2015. Why did you write that book? Because, because, and I say it was courageous because you didn't hold punches and it, it didn't matter who it was. And it wasn't personal because at the beginning mm -hmm. of the book, you said, this is not basically, this is not attack on anybody. Mm -hmm. This is me trying to tell the truth in order to help us kind of right some wrongs from the past. Mm -hmm. Rights and wrong, rights and wrongs that none of us created, we all inherited. Yeah. So it really started with, the, as I read a lot of the work on equity, I felt we were getting, reaching faulty conclusions because we were asking bad questions. Yeah. So I wanted to create a book that created a new set of questions. When we talk about things like equity, and let's just be honest, does everybody really want equity? It sounds good, yeah. but they don't build gated communities for equity. Right. They don't build Porsche dealerships for equity. And I ask the question, are people who are considered underperforming, do they really want to improve? And if so, the tools are available. Yeah. Why aren't you doing it? is underperformance or failure convenient? 
low expectations, no yep. culpability. You can always stay stuck in the problem. Right. So I felt both sides of the argument uh, were not really being authentic, that a lot of it was a farce. And we've almost made a cottage industry out of um, inequity and yeah. suffering rather than really looking for solving the problem. We come up with all new kinds of terms, new frameworks, but yet you go and walk into classrooms in some of the most uh, needy schools in the country and nothing's changed. So then what is the point of writing all these equity books right. and if nothing's gonna change? I thought both parties were comfortable where they were and the argument around equity served their purpose. I can blame everybody else, or I can defend status quo, yeah. but still say I'm humane and still say I believe in freedom and justice. Well, you can't have it both ways. So I wanted both parties to really ask the right questions and to just be honest. If we're not going to work towards it, then quit talking about it. Yeah. If you really want to do something about it, here's a pathway to take. You know, in, in the and in, in uh, Ken's new book, and mm -hmm. you wrote the foreword, you know, Ken talks about we we've, we've created, and you you've said like this kind of in industry and, and equity in terms of all these new terms and pie in the sky. You know, it's like it's it's missing the point because he's like, you know, if 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 we truly want equity, look in the classroom. Have we identified essential skills, essential mm -hmm. standards? Have we actually created common assessments? Are we like you were saying? Have we created? A system of interventions and extensions for students. Does mm -hmm. that's that's the that's a, a clear definition of what it should look like in classrooms. Are we looking at you know students and and saying what are they bringing to the table? Are we mm -hmm. looking at their cultural frame of reference? You know, one of my you know new heroes is Goldie Muhammad and Zaretta mm -hmm. Hammonds, and 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 mm -hmm. I know that you've spoken at conferences with them. Mm -hmm. So getting out of the clouds and bringing it into the classroom and making mm -hmm. sure that we're, we're not losing what it should look like is, is, is what you're talking about. Yeah. And on the other side, those districts who benefit from inequity. Yeah. That as, as people start to embrace Ken Williams philosophy, embrace the instructional practices of Goldie Muhammad and Dr. Sharaki Holly and Zaretta Hammond, then don't you weaponize your privilege by manipulating calls of government to move the goal line, yeah. to change the narrative, to change the, the objectives. Because when you start to see growth, your trick has always been, you just change the narrative. You just so stand down. Yeah. If you're not gonna help, get out of the way. Yeah. That's my message to those bedroom schools. Nobody's bothering you. Keep, keep working with your kids, keep yeah. knocking it out. But don't you open up your mouth when you start to see DC public schools rising. Right. Don't start, don't, don't start manipulating the government and changing the rules. And it's just bringing all of this, you see that, you see it's stimulating a fight or flight response. We see it in, in Florida. Yeah. With teachers of color leaving, with these ridiculous policies that are being passed. Yeah. Um, so, they obviously didn't read the book and heed the warning. Um, and they're insulting people who want to be seen, who want to be validated, who want to be liberated. That's the part. So the apathy and the learned helplessness on behalf of those who have not reached their potential, that's my message to them. Quit yeah. complaining about it. Let's do something. Yeah. But on the other end, stand down. Yeah. In your book, and before we go, because I, I know it's, it's late for you and you've been all over the place this week, but um, you talk about the superiority mindset, the victim mm -hmm. mindset, and, and the mindset that's going to really, um, really move us forward is the liberation mindset. And and I'm not going to you, ask you to go through each one, but what I would say is that you hit it out of the park. Um, and, and it just really started to not change my thinking, but make me bolder. Mm -hmm. Be honest. Um, when I started to read some of your work and just and just you know follow some of the things that you did, it made me start to say, okay. Although I've always operated in this way, or many times I've operated in this way, like you know we're going to treat every kid as as gifted, and we're going to make sure that they all have gifted practices. Um, I'm starting to, as you said, I don't care if you hold on to your gifted school. I mean, I'm going to mm -hmm. talk about the historical inequities of gifted schools, 
-hmm. but we're going to do our own thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I'm going to say that's that I, that's not right, but mm -hmm. that's not going to hold me back. Absolutely. And I think that's, yeah. that's something that you've kind of given a lot of people permission to kind of move forward and be bold about. And we have a legacy of people who are bold. Uh, um, Dr. Cruz and I did a, a, a podcast with a gentleman. Um, he was talking about his disappointment with some of the modern thinkers and modern educational influence. He called it tinkering in the gray. Yeah. That they won't take a stance. Yeah. That's not what Ray Charles did when he saw the, the, the injustice in Georgia. He didn't go back. Yeah. That's not what the stance Muhammad Ali made. That's not the, that's not what Jim Brown did. That's not what uh, uh, Ralph Ellison and the Harlem Renaissance. The, these people sacrificed yeah. for the greater good. And for us to get to this point and then be concerned about populist opinion yeah. or doing things that, 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 that don't offend. Well, progress can be offensive to those who are oppressors. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't want to be offended, then join us. Yeah. But all I'm saying is, I think we have to say is America has to live up to its promise. If you say liberty and justice for all, and I speak up for that, how much more American can you be? Bingo. Exactly. exactly. So it, uh, I learned very early, you're going to die anyway. Yeah. Don't die a coward. I mean, things come and go. Everything I have now, I can't take this with me. But I can leave a legacy that it makes it better for the ones behind. Me. So fear is one of the biggest enemies of the oppressed who are trying to become liberated. And you just, I won't give my oppressor that. You can use your powers, your institution, but you can't have my mind. You can't have my will. And if we all took that, that, that attitude, I believe game is over. Perfectly said. Perfectly said. Hey, Anthony, at the end of each one of my podcasts, I use this uh, old African proverb that my um, I said at my dad's funeral three years ago, as I go, I am wearing you. And it's just about all the people who I am wearing, um, who have helped me along the way. You know, I, there's no way I get here without so many people who have supported me. And, you know, one of those people who I wear constantly on all that I do is Anthony Muhammad. I Truly appreciate, you know, everything that you've done, the courage that you display, and just the way you go about your life, um, helping people, no matter who they are, but making sure that you help people who look like us, who need to be supported, but also pushed at times to make sure that we live up to what our parents, our grandparents said that, you know, we're, we're kings and queens. Absolutely. So I think- Thank um, you. Thank you for the work that you've done. And your school was the first to four award winning school, which is the best of the best in the PLC process. Uh, you've been an author. You've been a good friend. Uh, you've been a thought leader. You continue to be a thought leader. I'm looking forward to your upcoming work yeah. on a pathway for more kids getting gifted opportunities. All kids and, getting uh, gifted opportunities. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. I, I look forward to that. So thank you. And thank you for creating this platform and giving me a chance to share. And thanks right. for those who tuned in. And thanks so, so, so much. And, and again, um, safe travels this summer because this is your busy time. You're all over the place. Yeah. Yes. Thanks again for coming on a conversation with Brian. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Anthony. Bye-bye.